when I told him, I was like, yeah, we uh, we just hired this guy. He hasn't started yet. His name's Mike Scobie and in Africa. This guy goes, shit, you hired Mike Scobie. He's a legend. <laughs> Why I came to Field Ethos, it's that honesty that I really appreciated that you guys had already been doing. You don't see that very often today. And so it was nice to see, you know, just that true editorial honesty, something that I think magazines had generations ago and TV shows yeah. probably had long ago, but that's changed. What's up, dude? How you been? Doing good. Good, good. Doing good. Um, where have you been? Uh, all over the place. But uh, no, this time of year, you know, living in Florida is awesome and has been incredible. Uh, the the one thing right now, just being sort of uh, late spring, early summer, the fishing up at my cabin is just so damn good. So I've literally been like running up there doing like and that's where day, up in the Catskills in okay. uh, upstate New York. Yeah, I've been there. It's an awesome spot. Yeah, and so you know, it, it's just I, I dude, I had a fish on the other night. Just I, I literally went up there for a night. Um, just to get that last hour, you know, kind of hatch on the rivers right behind my house. And I had a fish eat that it took me into my backing in like three seconds. Like a brown trout won't do that. You, you know what I mean? And I was just like, oh my crap. Like it was, you know, fishing 6X because you got to fish these little flies, you know, size 20 fly on 6X tippet with a 15 foot leader. And he ate at dark. And you're sort of almost listening for the eat because you lose all vision so you have to just understand where your fly is you can see the ripples of where they're basically rising then you're casting looking at your line and being like hey, a fly should be there about now if he rises now you just set and and he did and it was awesome and he, he popped off at the bottom of this thing but took me 50 yards into my backing which i've never actually had happen on those rivers so this thing was you could just feel the weight it was just a yeah damn slob nice fish what's the what's like what's the temperature up there right now uh, it's hot during the days, but it cools off at night. You know, you, you saw the kind of the valley that I'm in. Once you're once that sun goes below the horizon, it, it gets pretty cold. So it's weird. Like you could have like 80, 85 degree days, and it'll still get into the 60s at night. So yeah. you know, you're sitting on a drift boat, like sweating all day, and then like that sun goes down, you're like, oh damn, yeah. I should have brought a, a sweater. Yeah. yeah, we camped out in your backyard one time, and it, it was like that. It was hot during the day, and then at night it was perfect camping yeah, it's weather. Perfect. Um, which is a little bit different than where we're sitting right now. It's hotter than the seventh ring of hell right now in Florida. Um, I noticed at the cabin this morning, you couldn't see out the front door or any of the windows. It was just like condensation, yeah, yeah. A, an inch thick of condensation. Yeah, that, that's the worst way. You know, because I'm so anal about my guns and stuff like that. So when I'm at the cabin, I want to go shoot some clays or something like that. You walk out and you bring like a, you know, I'll bring out my nice, you know, Krieg off clays gun. And, you know, this is not your average beater gun and you walk out and it's just like poof just sweating and it's the whole thing's just soaking wet and you're freaking out but full condensation yeah i make i get rid of it by just shooting high volume of stuff get the gun so damn hot that it hopefully it'll it burns <laughs> off evaporates off and yeah. then oil it down it's been pretty miserable i've been down here um kind of working on the studio space getting this table and everything this week and so i've I, i've got a new appreciation for uh your Florida summers that you've been enjoying here for the last two years, but yeah. last year it wasn't that bad. I think because it was my first sort of summer, yeah. really living down here, and I was like, okay, it's not so, it, <laughs> but it, it can suck. <laughs> there, there was a week like two weeks ago, it was like a hundred and five with at least four hundred percent humidity. Like it was, yeah. it was brutal. And so um, you and I were talking a while back, and uh, I think. Kim, um, Kimberly might have put some like jet ski skids on the dock while you were while you guys were getting uh, the dock uh, like redone because yes. uh, it was an old dock, and um, and you know just to be on the safe side, she got some jet ski skids like put on the dock, and you're like, mm, we're definitely not getting a jet ski. Yeah, I'm not Kenny Powers. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you know, dude, get, get myself a pair of pit vipers and like grow out the mullet a little bit more. It'll dude, be awesome. But like, it would be awesome if you had a jet ski. And jet you skis just are raced. fun. Like they're all good. Listen, they're great. But, like once a year. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm not gonna like I. You know, you, you rent it, you use a friend's jet ski, you, you do something like that. But, and also, like, my children have, like, a, basically the same amount of self-control that I have, which is, uh, let's just say they inherited my entirely, like, underdeveloped sense of self-preservation. Yep. And so, like, Tristan, Spencer, any of those little animals, like, uh, like on a, they, they would last maybe five minutes before just like going into a dock at like 100 miles an hour. Is Donnie more cautious than the uh, younger two boys? Uh, Donnie is a little bit more nat naturally it's, it's sort of cautious. Uh, the the other two, you know, they, they were on ATVs at four years old. and Wide like, open. You know, yeah, you haven't, like just, and it's 
They're stealing mine because, you know, their little 50 cc's weren't enough. They needed, you know, 500s. And six, and, they, and I'm looking, I'm like, oh, my God, like the kid's going to lose it. Like, yeah. he, you know, taking a, I'll come in, like, you know, my side by side, the bumper's all bent and torqued. I'm like, they're like, wasn't me. I'm like, <laughs> oh, really? Like, oh, and it just, it magically was sitting in the garage and, like, you know, just it, this happened. Like, you know, it's, yes. It well, there, that, I mean, that's called being a being a boy. Oh, by um, the way, no, I'm not saying, like yeah. I said, it's, I see it myself. Makes you proud, but at the same yeah, time, you're like, like, I don't know whether to be upset or impressed. I'm just like, damn, they, they, they got, yeah. you know, it's definitely, they're mine. Yeah. Um, so you're looking for kind of a, a flat skiff like you and I have been talking about it so what the reason I brought up the jet ski skids is like it was perfect uh, for you to be able to get like a micro skiff to put on the dock yeah uh, to maybe start doing some um, flats fishing down here so you get you onto the salt water with your fly rods yeah um, and be able to do it kind of well and, I, and I, I'm nice. on the intercoastal so it's just yeah. it's so easy I can go hit the snook lights within five minutes I'd be out there every night for you know an hour or two Dude, uh, you got to yeah. get we got to get that done because like that would be a lot of fun yeah. to come down here and and like that's also the better thing for the boys you actually teach them about boats like I, I got lucky I grew up on the water in Connecticut uh, you know in my summers and stuff like that so you know, didn't had you like, have like a little whaler I had an 11 foot whaler yeah you know just a little tiny thing but I mean there was nothing I couldn't do on that thing I mean yeah. uh, you know it, it, it I'd spent days on end on that boat and just learned everything there was to know about it that way so you know looking forward to getting them and something cool that they yeah. can play with and we got to get that so that when we come down here to record these podcasts, you can take us fishing. Um, so our guest today, um, somebody that uh, you and I were really excited uh, to get him uh, at Field Ethos with us. Um, you know, when we didn't even realize it was going to well, be. And now, we, now that we know, it and, was, and now was we're totally not, like overblown. But like, you now know. we feel like we <laughs> might have made a mistake. But initially, we were like super excited. Yeah. Um, and we had a, we had a, chat with uh with mike scoby early on um i say early on is about a year ago maybe a little over a year ago um and we were it, it wasn't a it was not a job interview it was it, Correct. we were not even trying to hire him we just didn't you know it wasn't well, an option frankly, i think we assumed it wasn't even an yeah, option yeah. I and mean, it probably had you know one of the uh bigger roles in sort of the outdoor publishing space yep. in, in all of america mm -hmm. uh, tenure like no one else had had sort of been there done that with everything and so it was like this is a guy we'd pick his brain if we were lucky to get that information and i'd, yeah. I'd interviewed with mike that's actually what uh, we were doing is picking his brain on yeah. something actually osg was um i think we were talking about this podcast they wanted you and i to do some kind of like hunting show or something we're like no we're not going to do a hunting show but you guys, we can do something with our podcast and do like a film version yeah. of the podcast. I think it was Edder. I think it was Dave Edder. It was like, you ever think about like hiring Mike? I was like, I didn't realize that was an option. He's like, I think there's something dude, there. Like, we yeah. got off the phone and I called I called Edder and I go, dude, we got to try to hire Scobie. And he's like, it's funny that you say that because he actually called me and said like, what are you guys doing over there? Like, you know, what's what are, what are your options looking like uh, over the next year? So anyways, we hired Mike. What's up, Mike? Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks so, for hiring me. Thanks for having dude, me. Dude, um, everybody... Good to have you on the team, Mike. Everybody uh, everybody loves Mike Scobie. Like, yes. you hear story after story. Like, even in Africa, Andrew, um, Andrew uh, uh, Pringle, um, when I told him, I was like, yeah, we... Uh, we just hired this guy. He hasn't started yet. His name's Mike Scobie. And in Africa, this guy goes, shit, you hired Mike Scobie. He's a legend. Um, cause, cause he's it, a legend in many places, apparently, but yeah. I'm not sure that's for the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but one day. So like Jason Hornady hunts over there with, uh, with Andrew and, um, the guys from loophole. And so, and since you're friends with all those guys, uh, your name had come up several times in some fireside stories in Africa. So even Andrew Pringle across the world was like, oh, that guy's a legend. I've been hearing about him for years. Um, so, I mean, you're just always, always so much fun. I knew we were going to have, so yesterday, um, you were fishing in New York. Yep. Uh, we went fishing down here and, um, and I, I had been down here in Florida, uh, at the cabin for like four days by myself, you know, just like shopping, getting stuff done for, for this place. And, um, so I was getting, uh, I was ready to have somebody to talk to when everybody started getting into town. And then, um, and we decided to go kind of last minute to fish yesterday and we went offshore, just had a huge time. Um, it was, that was a fantastic, it was, it was, it was a just good nice day. people. <clears throat> I mean, group of people we did not know before that, but it seems like, I think you even talked about that yesterday. 
we fall in with the right crowd. Yeah. You know what I mean? These, these people were just salt of the earth, awesome. Had a 51 foot Viking. Viking yeah, 51 or 52 Viking. 52 Viking. And they just loved to have a good time, loved to fish, fit in with us. We fit in with them. It was fun. And this was not a charter. This was. Uh, um, we hunted with. I mean, he was the guy that won. Yep. Uh, right. You know, the field ethos contest that we did for the deer hunt. Yeah. You know, with me. And like, that, that was a great time at, you know, with John Hill. Yeah. Uh, His and, name is Joel McLeod. He's a captain here. Yeah. And super Stewart. good dude. And him and I just started talking fishing right away. I'm like, you're right up the road. Like, it's yep. it, just by coincidence. And so. He, so he knew these boat owners. Um, Joel did. I called Joel uh, and said, hey, we're all in town um and we've got kind of a free day before we do some recording um are you fishing you know anybody else that we can fish with and, and he called me back and he's like yeah these people um they'd love to take you guys and um i think they assumed that you were coming with us and they're huge <laughs> huge trump fans happy to get you on there uh, yeah yeah well I, you know i i so anyway you got to let them donnie because i was like hey donnie you want to go fishing uh what time like seven, that wasn't even an early start for offshore, right? Like, yeah. you know, I'm used to like the 3 a.m. wake up call for offshore. I'm like, they'll pick you up at 7.30. It's like, oh. That's in a late the, morning. In the morning? Yeah, he's, he's hitting that, you know, teen, uh, that yeah. teen age where like anything before like one o'clock in the afternoon is like, I can't, I uh, like, Yeah, like, but I will say it. like, if you get him like, out of the house, the water. you get him out of the house, get him away from the TV and the video games and all that stuff on the, and he's just like every other kid. Uh, but when you get him out, when you get Donnie out, like, no, you get him to great. Alaska, like there is no, have fun. there's no, there's, there's, but what I'm saying is like, he doesn't struggle to wake up early on a hunting trip. Like he's ready to roll, you know, yeah. he's excited to hunt. So I think this is just that summertime being leaving a, the comforts of home, dude, right? air conditioning, yeah, you know, just television, being a kid set. during the summer and, and he's, he's a little late. bit more shy also. He didn't know anyone else. So he yeah. knew you obviously, but yeah. So, well, I called Don and I was like, Hey, you want me to take Goaty uh, fishing with us tomorrow morning? He's like, dude, you know, he's, he's already called me. He's like, he's bored. He wants to go do something fun. Um, but, uh, and so he's like, yeah, if you guys will take him, I'm sure he, he's up for it. And then um, Don didn't factor in the fact that he had probably stayed up till three o'clock in the morning the night before and was yeah. just tired. But we had a good day fishing. Um, we took, uh, it was me, you, Jeff Johnston, uh, Tony Caggiano, our good buddy that at some point is going to be a guest on, on this podcast. Um, and, and then, um, Aurelia skip with the former director of us, uh, fish and wildlife, who will be a guest on this podcast. Um, and then Joel, and then this couple that owned the boat, uh, and their crew. And so it was just a lot of fun. We paid, we paid for all their gas and the bait and tipped out the, the captain and the mate and everything. But it, this was just like a friendly, like invite, like y'all come on. And yeah. so, uh, you're going to have to like go to their house and do like a birthday party, um, like function for well, them pop out point. of like a birthday cake yeah, or like, type of thing. Yeah, since you didn't come back, like I was like, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so <laughs> yeah, Donald, come do the the dancing monkey thing for your birthday or something. Um, but uh, I noticed when we were getting on, like they're like, oh, you, you, you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> where, where is it? Where is it? Because we disappointed. But they are big Trump fans. The guys from Georgia, actually Athens, Georgia, which is right up the street from me. Nice. Um, so yeah, good friend to make. But um, well, I think I think like literally of all the like demographics of the world i think the sport fish community is like so true literally like like yeah i don't i don't know that i've met someone i mean even in like liberal harbors up north in like the hamptons and stuff like that you go and you look at the sport fish boats and like they were all flying trump flags in like the heart of like yep. dystopian yeah uh you know you never saw a sport fishing boat with a biden flag i'm not like i did not ever see one not exactly. because there's no government program handing out boats yeah. uh, once <laughs> once the government starts giving out boats you'll see a lot of uh yeah, uh, you'll see true. a lot of biden flags so. so um yeah so these guys are super maga and and uh, a lot of fun um and i'm glad to to have met them so that I can hang out with them when they get back up to Georgia. So. Uh, I'm not sure we're welcome back. You, we're not, well, did we over party? No, we did not. Actually, they... How many, how many mimosas did... Uh... <laughs> oh, I wouldn't say how many. It was more how many bottles of champagne yeah, we yeah. went through. You, was, you gotta judge it by the bottle, not the... Yeah, we don't count per drink. We count by case, no, case of champagne. They enjoyed drinking, they enjoyed fishing, and the fishing was great. I mean, yeah. we caught sailfish, tuna, bonitas, um, what else did we get? Uh, yeah, I caught a black mahi. fan. We got two uh, mahi. Mahis. Um, it's good. Yeah, it was just a, a good shark. A good mix. Yeah, really, I caught a big shark. Yeah. Um, yeah. By the way, that's like the most guaranteed thing in all of fishing. Like everyone, like the shark, such a novelty. Like in in South Florida, like yeah. you're you, gonna you literally one. like put something bloody on a hook and like wait seven seconds and like you're yeah. Out of shark, actually, right? we're trying not to catch sharks. All yeah, they're biting fish in half. There, that's wild. the problem. I mean, these days, like there's so many people 
you know, there's all these like dive charters that go out and they feed the sharks. Like some of these sharks used to be migratory and they just, they're just resident sharks now. And because of all that feeding, they associate boats with food. So they hang around the boat. Like it's, I have guys that are serious sailfish guys. They're like, if, if we can get land 50% of the sailfish, you know, they're getting eaten. Like it's, it's, yeah. Well, we saw that yesterday. Remember, right when we were catching that shark, we were going past a dive boat that they were photographing sharks. They were obviously chumming them up in there yeah. as well and, and for that photo purpose. So, yeah, we, uh, when I hooked up on that, um, that black fin tuna, which is like one of my favorite fish, it went past the boat. Like it, it turned into the boat and actually passed us as we were still pulling. And, yeah, um, they normally, their normal move would be go to straight down. Dude, and then I, I was like, that's weird that he's passing by the boat. And then I saw the huge shadow of the shark behind him, and then he took off straight down. Like, he was running from that shark. and um, So, yeah, we saw a lot of sharks yesterday, but um, just a really good time. And, um, man, it's like every time you're around, I always know. I'm like, this is going to be – whatever we're doing is going to be fun. We're going to laugh a lot because um, Mike's always just mm-hmm. saying inappropriate things all the time to make everybody uh, feel welcome and, and make them <laughs> or, laugh. Or really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is also hysterical. Just as good. So, it, it yeah. breaks the ice. It gets people in a regular state. Yeah. So um, we, when we hired you, it was, like, it was a big, big move for us. Um, and you came on, and you really kind of changed a lot of what we were doing. You, you'd been in the business for um, – I don't know, like 20 years at the time. And it was like, okay, you, you were like, okay, w- w- we kind of need to blow this up a little bit and then put the pieces back together. Uh, and you did that. So from a business standpoint, you really changed the way we do business uh, for the better. Um, and things have just um, continued to build. Uh, our momentum has continued to build pretty much since the day um, you came on. And, and so you were kind of a... I don't know. You're crucial to to where our company is right now and where it's headed and, and options we have now that, that didn't exist before we got you. But um, so tell us a little bit about like why did you why did you agree to even come work with us? Um, you know, what was it about? Because you had a really good job before. Sure. No, um, I was not looking right. Not looking. Not. And I think if there was another group of guys that approached me, investment guys or money guys, hey, we want to start a media brand. And you know, we're well-funded and you know, we've got this idea for it. Would you join? Probably wouldn't have. You know, I, I was very comfortable where I was at. Um, that said, between, you know, I think Don's momentum, what you'd build as a brand, after I had a conversation with you guys, I looked at it and said, this is a big deal. You know, it's not just a well-funded media company that's got great potential, but it's a brand that you personally developed that – doesn't come with so much of the baggage of an old legacy media brand, you know, and I, and I say that with, it's not a complaint or with all due respect. I work for Peterson's Hunting, I work for Guns and Ammo, you know, titles that have been around as long as I have been around or older, <clears throat> in many cases, 60 year old type brands. The problem with that is, is you, you can't reinvent that brand, you know, because you have a group of legacy subscribers that are 55, 60, 70 years old. They expect a product that they've you know, been buying for 40 years. So if you want to change the direction of a, a legacy brand, it's really difficult to attract that new, younger demographic into that because you're already servicing a customer group that's probably in their twilight years where you started a brand that's young and talking to that next group of customers. And by design, I mean, you said it many times that, you know, you're looking for that 35 to 50 year old demographic, that next generation, not the kids per se, but the next spending, adventuring sportsman. And I, and I kind of saw that one. Man, you guys really got something here. That's something that is a very rare opportunity to have. Although I see it a lot, actually. It, it, we're grabbing the kids, too, because I think they, they love the sort of unapologetic sort of approach to all of this stuff. Like, it's sort of surprising to me, if, you know, given everything else that I, I – like, I'm out at a lot of these places, and anywhere there's a sort of a sportsman's group that's like, hey, man, I love what you're doing with Field Ethos. Not, like, politically or this. It's like they like that because it's sort of hard to believe that void has not been yeah sort of filled by anyone. I mean, anyone new in hunting, it's like, you know – the woke hunt, they love sort of the allure of maybe being a hunter, but never actually have done it. And like, it, this right. is just a different. Well, it was, it, it was, that's how it started though, is yeah. because you and I both felt like nobody really makes a magazine for me. You know, right. Don, that's, that's how this well, really. Sorry, you and I did an interview like for, yeah. uh, you know, I guess Sporting Classics. And, yep. it, and it was sort of like during the interview, we're realizing like everything that's missing. Yeah. Uh, you know, to bring on, you know, that next, you know, that next round of, uh, you know, outdoorsmen and women. 
Yep. Uh, since we got to be very politically. Yeah, we do. Um, but uh, yeah, it was during that and then sort of started a text chain about all the kind of craziness about like who's representing hunters today. And it's like we're being represented by people who basically don't hunt. Like it's hard right. to believe. Yeah. Well, and that was another thing, you know, that I guess I probably didn't realize it even until talking to you that, you know, it had gotten under my skin. I realized it on a subconscious level, but I hadn't really vocalized it. But this very dishonest um you know, I hunt for meat, you know, that yeah. movement, which is attracting so many people. It's such a very dishonest position to come from and a very undefendable position to come from because, okay, what if you can't eat deer anymore? Let's say, you know, a new version of CWD or EHD comes down the pipe that you can't eat deer anymore. Are you still going to hunt? And you would because there's other reasons why you hunt, yeah. you know, whether it's food is part of it, but it's also the culture and your family and your vacation and your excitement and, you know, their heritage. There's many reasons why we hunt. But, that, you know, I was very disgusted to see how many hunters are being bamboozled really into getting into hunting for the first time because of this allure of meat. I mean, meat is, like we've all said, we all eat it. It's what feeds my family, but that's not the why. No, why we correct. Hunt. No. Um, we do it because it's fun. It's an adventure and like, cause we wouldn't be happy if we didn't do it, you know? Um, and those other things are great too. But, um, so when, so we brought you on and, um, one thing I didn't even know when we brought you on, cause like, you know, I hate, um, hunting shows. Like I just, I, I don't watch them. I don't like them. Um, but I didn't realize you've done actually what sound, and I need to, I do need to watch him at some point because we're good buddies now. And, and I probably want to see what you were doing before you came on here, but you did a couple of really cool projects. Um, you did one where you, um, went all the way across the country in like a pickup truck or a Jeep or something where you were filming all your sporting adventures, but you're also probably internationally one of the most well-traveled hunters on earth, uh, because of the shows that you were producing and a lot of that yeah so you have a ton of i mean you're 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 a very accomplished hunter in north america and and fly fisherman but um but global experience you've got a ton like a lot more than a lot more than um just about anybody you could you could possibly meet and uh and and then when you got back from alaska the other day um you you kind of put it in perspective for me you went to steamboat with um, yeah yeah, with uh with charlie benton and sean skipper from loophold uh charlie's a charlie's our new guy uh here at field ethos awesome dude uh but scoby said um he's like man i've been to like 150 lodges around the world Mm -hmm. and uh this was by far the most like just like humming operation. Like he's like, it yeah. just, it, there was, there was zero glitches here. Um, and I went, shit, Scopey's been to 150 yeah. lodges. Like, well, that's well, what I, people don't under, like, there's a lot of guys in the industry. You see them at all the shows and stuff like that, that really don't know that much about, uh, oftentimes even whatever it is that they're working at, you yeah. know, they're, they're a marketing guy for yeah. someone, but doesn't like, you know, Scoby is, Accomplished, he know he knows some obscure stuff. Like I'm a pretty good encyclopedia oh, he's a gun of gun nerd. knowledge. He's a gun he's nerd. He's a total gun nerd. Going back into like some really weird old stuff, he knows all that. But like, but then he can also execute a hell of a shooter in all the disciplines. A hell of a fly fisherman. Like he's actually that sort of well-rounded outdoorsman. Yeah. Like I want to, you know, I try to pride myself on being that. I just don't think actually exists all that much. So many guys are sort of, well, they're good at maybe one thing. Oftentimes in the industry, sure. not even that. Yeah, uh, he's actually great at all of them. So it's actually nice to be with an actual outdoorsman instead of just a talker. Yeah, thank you. But you know, it's funny how many years it took you to learn that, right? Oh, you too. I'm, I'm 50 right? yeah, years like, old. I'm 49. I'll be 50 next year. And I started hunting and fishing at six, seven years old. You know, so you'll talk to these and, and very passionate about it. Like when I was in college, I was amazed I ever graduated. I just you know hunt and fished all the time, five days a week at least. And then right after college, at 25 years old, I I've always wanted to go to Africa. I've been reading Capstick as a kid and Ruark. Met an African outfitter um, when I was 25. I was working at a gun shop, and he just came in because he was at a sports show and wanted to buy a gun and bring back with him, and we hit it off. He goes, why don't you come over on safari? I'm like, oh, I could never afford that, you know, and it was cheap. It was, I think, all in with airfare. He cut me a deal with like $5,000, so it was a couple $3,000 safari. I sold every possession I had, sold every gun I had. I kept a Winchester Model 70 and 270, and I think my 870 shotgun. That's all I had left. 
and I still had to borrow like two thousand yeah, <laughs> dollars. Yeah. Sold everything I had and raised a couple grand, and uh, went on my first safari. Yeah. You know, so I was you on, you lived there, and then that outfitter's like, I really like you. Why don't you come over and work for me for a year? So that's I ended up working there and traveling to various lodges that he owned or ones that he was looking at purchasing. And then that rolled into, because of that travel experience, well, more writing, editing, because that was what was kind of paying the bills. You didn't make a lot of money in Africa. But then Gander Mountain hired me as the head of their travel division, their outdoor sporting travel division. So I ran that for six years. And that job was amazing for travel. Yeah. I mean, in the sense that that's why I've been to so many lodges. It was like, okay, go, you know, here's your budget. You get an annual budget. We had two private jets. Everybody wonders why this company went out of business. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pretty bad business model. <laughs> but essentially, it's like, here's your annual budget of X number of dollars and travel around and check out lodges and if they're good. And so you got a perspective because you'd go see all these lodges and go, ah, they did this right and they don't do this right. And that's why when I went to that Steamboat Bay, I go, this might be the best lodge I've ever been. And the fishing was not even good. As you know, you were in Canada. I was in Canada before. literally the same time in British Columbia. And like, y'all were a week early, right? It, yeah, it, probably. It, Maybe two weeks, like yeah. you know, you know, Great Lingcod, the halibut was good, uh, yep. you know, that kind of <clears> stuff. <throat> but we were there for Kings, and they just weren't there yet. I guess yep. they, had, you know, they had some really bad storms. It was a late spring, and you know, they weren't there. And if they're not there, doesn't matter. Like I mean, it caught a you know something and, nice, but not, not really. And that really should be what viewers, listeners take away from this is that I think they so often make judgments about a place based on the quality Correct. of hunting and fishing in the sense that that's uncontrollable. You know, you can go to Africa, yeah. you can go yeah. to Alaska and it just may not be good, but the controllables, and I've seen it go the other way where guys go, man, that's the best operation. It's like, yeah, you had a good, you killed something that was nice. The operation was very lacking, you know, yeah. in, in the attention to detail. So I love when I see a place that all the things they can control, they control. And that stems from, I was even thinking, you were asking me what was so good about that lodge. Even things like towels. You know, you go into your bathroom, yeah. and they were high-end towels. You just yeah. way nicer than what I have you at mean, home. Not the yeah. ones that like you dry yourself off and you stay wet, <laughs> and they feel like sandpaper. I mean, these you picked up, you go, these are really high-end towels. You know, you get in bed, and you're like these sheets are awesome. You know, yeah. I, uh, I told Jason they had a gal that actually was a mixologist there, and I come in and she goes, you know, what would you like to drink? And I go, I don't have a Negroni, and she goes, oh, we don't have Campari, one of the main ingredients in Negroni. And I go, that's okay, you know, old fashioned or whatever you're making. I don't, don't need anything fancy. The next day I came in and there's Negroni set up and ready to be made. And I'm like, how'd you get Campari? She's like, oh, we flew some in today. I mean, flew in a bottle of Campari because somebody wanted a cocktail. They didn't have a drink. It was just that level. Listen, between you and the, you know, Negronis and you and the damn mimosas, like, we're getting a little bit of, <laughs> we're going to have to get you guys drinking a little bit more cheap beer or yeah. something like that. Like, yeah. we're, getting, we're getting a little off brand and the like, spoiled, like, we're uh, pampered entitled. I, Dave was working on, you know, we, we. I worked at a bar. I never even heard of what you're talking about. Like, uh, yeah, it's, it's just a gin drink. It's no, it's Campari, a good drink. It's a good Campari drink. Campari and gin. Yeah. You know, um, so Dave, his like, so Dave owns a spirits brand. He makes yeah. drop time, um, uh, drop time bourbon. Moonshine. Um, he makes moonshine. He makes very, very, very good vodka. The bourbon's good. The moonshine's good. His vodka is exceptional. Um, and so Dave has kind of been spearheading, making a field ethos champagne, uh, working with Trump winery. Mm -hmm. And we got Alex to design this label and everything. And it had some oranges on it. And I was looking at it and I was like, wait a second, I bought a bottle of Trump champagne a couple years ago and it was damn good, but it was also damn expensive. I was like, we're, we're not going to be selling cases of champagne. That's, you know, $60 a bottle for we, somebody to pour orange juice into. Yeah. We need to come up with like a real cheap product. We, we need that. the natural yeah, light. We need the natty light uh, of, champagne. of champagne. Yeah, we do. <laughs> so, so we're still going to do the, uh, I think, I think we're still doing something with uh, Trump winery. Um, but we're, we also need yeah, something. Yeah, that champagne has won like San Francisco. Dude, it's won a lot of major if, awards. Now, if they knew it was us, now obviously that's all blind taste test because you know those people probably hate the fact that it's it's actually a spectacular place. But uh, yeah, it, it's know. that that is some of the best champagne I've ever had. Um, and so that's kind of why we went after it. And then I was like, ah, it's too expensive to be pouring orange juice in it. Um, so we're gonna go after a real a real uh, low end champagne that's just high drinkability. Um, but yeah, so. Scoby does love to have a good cocktail. Um, and he, I don't know, he's always having, you know, we'll do a meeting on a Tuesday afternoon or something and he'll pour himself a drink and, and people are like, you guys, you know, people see me drinking in my office or something. And they're like, you guys drink while you're working. I'm like, yeah, that's like, that's normal. Yeah, there's times I'm yeah. like, I don't know, maybe we're going a little too far <laughs> with, with the image that we've Always created. the response. But, yeah. but, but it is authentic. It, yeah, uh, it is. But when they're acting like alcoholics, it's not because 
<laughs> they're putting on a show it's because it's maybe... we like to have a drink um but yeah so anyway you came on um you changed some of the things we've done you have a ton of travel experience um you brought up that that steamboat trip the same time that you were down you were in alaska i was with tony Caggiano in um argentina and i called you to tell you what an operation this place was um the hunting was good um we killed you know we killed a ton of doves and and had some great duck hunts and um so that, but that's kind of a given that's argentina the birds are going to typically be there uh but this place was like the most finely tuned machine i've ever seen like the operation itself and so um one thing we're going to be doing and, and we have the benefit of your your knowledge in this area as well we're getting ready ready to launch um, the Field Ethos Outrider experiences where somebody from Field Ethos will accompany, uh, accompany a group on a trip. So you will come to us to help plan your trip, um, plan your adventure, and one of us is going with you uh, to make sure it goes off without a hitch. And we're going to do things at that steamboat place that you went because it was just too nice to not work with them. Um, and actually, by the way, the reason the guy um, that owned Steamboat reached out you got stuck on a tarmac with this guy in Chicago. This guy's a, a, he owns a bunch of hotels in Chicago, Peter Churchborn, I think is his name. And, um, and he, he called me and he's like, yeah, like five years ago, six years ago, I think it was before your dad was president. He's like me and Don got caught on a runway and they held us out there for like five yeah, hours. Like I was on the plane that caused the rules change. To like what you could and couldn't do is yeah. like the FAA changed the rules. That was couple, the flight where you met a this couple guy. of those delays where they put people on a tarmac for seven hours and then they canceled really? the flight and like so they, they literally changed the like I was on that plane. So like, this, this guy was, was on that flight. This, this guy was, was on that flight with flight. you. It's a commercial flight. This guy was on that flight with you. I think uh, maybe Ivanka and Eric were on that flight as well. Uh, but this guy, he was like, yeah, I'm I'm on this flight with Don and we start talking about hunting and fishing and he was like, shit, Don's like. Don's a real sportsman. And so he recently bought, I think he recently bought Steamboat and Waterfall, maybe. That's right. Um, and so when he bought it, he's like, I want to get these guys to come. And so you couldn't come. And, and Peter was like, oh, he can come next year or whatever. Uh, but you guys go ahead and come. So anyways, we got this invite because of you. This was, uh, this was a nice a nice invite. And, um, and so we're going to actually go into business with these guys, do these field ethos outrider programs where – you know, every once in a while, Scobie will lead a trip, or I'll lead a trip, or Jeff will, or Charlie Benton, or somebody. One of us will be there to make sure everybody has a good time. And Scobie's been kind of doing this now for a long time. Well, it, there's a pattern developing here that people invite Dawn really cool places, and then he doesn't go, and we slip into the place. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, yeah. And then they're just like, oh, you showed up. Ah, why are you here? Yeah, how, how about this? Like, the fishing stuff you guys can take, because I got good yeah. fishing in my backyard, and like, you know... Yeah. Y- you get a you get a group sheep hunt going, and I'm in. Oh okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Don's not uh, Don's uh, not going to let us take his sheep. Yeah, hunt. no. That's there's certain things sure. where I draw the line. I'm happy to be a team player up, uh, until you get into like curly horns shit. You know? yeah, Let's we, take a break real quick. Uh, talk about this gun, Don. This sitting on the table. Um, I know you looked at it earlier. Um, tell us about this one. Listen, this is that little the new Taurus, and it's. I was actually really sort of most impressed with the trigger yeah uh and i know you know when we started working sort of with taurus people you know started ah well Taurus. honestly man like i've been impressed with some of the stuff that they've been uh sending us to yeah. play with like you know me i'm into the big boar stuff and i hunt with them and uh i spent a lot of time out there with uh, uh you know revolvers just living in new york state you know before i moved down here so many restrictions on rifle hunting so you just try to make it fun cool and like you know slug guns get old after a while so I did so much, and uh, that Raging Hunter's a badass gun, man. I, you know, you like that one, yeah. With, with an do. aim point, I'm shooting, you know, three inch groups at 100 yards, like it's nothing with a 44. And uh, I mean, when we were out west uh, in Colorado, I mean, I, I think I, I think I had the record. Uh, I think I went, I went five for seven with the 357 at what was it, 350? 350, yeah. like a deer size steel oh, 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 cut with, with, with a red dot, like yeah. you know, So just you know, that was some significant holdover, but. Um, re- really impressed with what they're what they're coming up with, and they're certainly uh, doing whatever they can to change maybe a reputation that they had built up, you know, decades ago. But Brett's doing an, an incredible job. Yeah, and he's cool as hell as, too. He's a great guy to hang out with, also, and just another one of those guys, just gun nerd, very knowledgeable, like on the manufacturing yeah, side. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. not just a CEO, yeah. but like he gets it. He, knows he understands it. Yeah. the stuff, and he was talking to me about like 
you know, weird stuff they don't even do, but like gun technology, getting into like the long range stuff and barrel technology and all this stuff. And I was, right. it was awesome to see someone young. Uh, it's like the youngest with, CEO with in the industry. And like, For sure. he, but with real knowledge also. Yeah. And it was awesome to see that. So I had several friends that were like, um, have you met Brett for he's yet? And I'm like, nah. It, it, they're like, dude, you guys would get along great. You got to meet Brett. Uh, so Kevin Brittingham, a couple of people were telling me that. And I finally got a chance to, I met Brett in Africa. Um, he was there at the same lodge. Like we kind of split. He was there before we got there. We left after he left. Um, but I got a few days to hang out with him. And, and he lives in Georgia. And he and I have become good buddies. Um, big fan of him likes someone. If Brittingham <laughs> likes us a lot. It says yeah. a lot. Like, <laughs> if you get through that yeah. <laughs> that gauntlet of uh, likability, that's a solid uh, endorsement. Yeah, it is. Um, and actually, the, the first time I saw the GX4 was on the kitchen island at Brittingham's house. Um, yeah. He had it sitting there. And he's like, dude, this thing's badass. Kevin Brittingham is maybe the toughest gun critic on the planet. He's, he's a flat-out asshole if he doesn't like you. Right. If, oh, he yeah. lo- if he likes you, he loves you, and he's so uh, – I, I love Kevin. He and That's I are right. good friends. Um, but if, if he – like, he, he will not hesitate to pick up a gun and be like, this thing sucks. Right. Uh, but he was like, dude, this pistol is awesome, and he's such a gearhead. Yeah. Um, that With his endorsement, I was like, okay, i got to mess with this thing. So I think that's the best trigger on, like, a, it is. a, a, on the a compact, yeah. like, you know, strike or fire gun, period. Like, So what this what this gun is, for those of you guys watching, it, this one is in direct competition with the Springfield Hellcat, the 6-hour P365, and the Glock 43. 43, 43 yeah. Um, so it, it from a from a size standpoint, where it fits into the firearms industry is right there in that small nine millimeter subcompact, and it's cheaper. The trigger is better. I don't think like I'm not going to say it's I don't think I'm I'm not going to say it's better than any of those others because I think they're all about equal really these days. Um, it's personal preference, but I would say it it's not lacking anything uh, behind the Hellcat or the mm-hmm. Sig Sauer 365. It's every bit as good. Well, what, what's the, what's the price point different? Um, this one is going to be like high threes, um, where those other ones are like mid fours. Right. Um, so none of them are none of them are like super expensive pistols, uh, but they're not super cheap either. Uh, but this one is going to be in the high threes. It's going to be s- probably seventy five bucks cheaper than those other ones, but it's a lot of gun for the money. Um, yeah. This one, yeah, people hate Taurus. I'll be honest. I, I've I've said some shitty things about Taurus that I feel like they've earned. Um, but now they're doing some yeah, really cool it's stuff. Just, that's the problem. To your point, maybe about the legacy magazines, even right. It's hard, it, to, change it's hard to change those things. You could be great in doing it, and that's why. Like, I mean, when I posted the picture of me with, you know, the Taurus and the chest rig, because, you know, that little uh, tracker is a badass little gun, too. Yeah. Uh, I really like the steel tracker, especially. Uh, shot very accurately, uh, you know, and I'm like, oh, what is that, the Smith 329 PD? And, you know, yada, yada. I was like, no, it's a Taurus. They're like, why would you carry a Taurus? <laughs> yeah. No, sure. Like, that, that was sort of the, the commentary. And it was like, hey, we're, we're giving this a shot. We're going to see. And, you know, and Brett was totally cool. It was like, hey, if you don't like the product, you can kill us. Yeah. And like, really? Like that's, yep. you know. He, mo- no, we told, we told him the only way we're going to work with you guys is if y'all are cool with us telling the truth because that's how we are. We're unfiltered. And if it sucks, we're going to tell people it sucks. And he's like, yeah. dude, we'll do it. Like, we'll take yeah. the Pepsi and challenge. That, ra- right. that Raging Hunter will shoot right there with my Freedom Arms. Yep. And I have a dozen of them. Like, it's, it's an impressive gun. Like, well, I, can't, I have nothing bad to say about it. It's like, but in that environment, like, so Taurus doesn't make a safe queen. They make a they make a, yeah. a gun to take in the field, something that is less expensive than the competition that you can beat up and you're not going to be broken hearted about it. Where you and I, uh, where where we had those guns, it is harsh salt Alaska air, yeah. salt water the whole time. Everything is getting rusted. You're um, in and out of boats. The salt spray is there. Right. You got a forty mile an hour wind. You're you're oftentimes hunting the beaches yeah or at least spending time you know like you can't there's no way of staying dry to get to even where you're hunting and if you're not in the beaches you're in that like alaskan rainforest so you know if you're handgun hunting it's it's going to get wet and it's going to stay wet all day yeah and there's nothing you can do about it and and that's a perfect gun for it like that's one that that will perform when you need it you're not going to get all busted up if you get some rust on it or tear it up you know that's Jumping back to why I came to Field Ethos, it's that honesty that I really appreciated that you guys had already been doing. Not, yeah. <clears throat> that's not something I brought to the table. That's, yeah. That was your guys' ethos and what you're doing. And you don't see that very often today. You know, yeah. but Every XP 12,000 is the greatest thing the greatest ever. ever yeah. I would not have been able to shoot that deer at seven yards if it wasn't for. Yep. Yeah. 
No. And so it was nice to see, you know, just that true editorial honesty, something that I think magazines had generations ago and TV shows yeah. probably had long ago, but that's changed. And I do like to see, you know, we, we have very good partners and we partner with people that are the best in category. I don't ever want our viewers to think, oh, they're elitists and they only yeah. shoot Krieg off K-80s. It's like, no, we shoot all kinds of guns. It's got to be a good gun. Yeah. It's got to be good gear. Reliable. Uh, and is Reliable, it workable, you know. Um, and, and that's when we talk about this Outrider program. I don't want it to be snotty and snooty and this, you know, only an elitist type thing. But if you really want places that will always take care of you and you're not going to be let down, yeah. that's kind of what you end up going with is these very few proven places that go, they, they do the best. Yeah. Listen, a lot of that's, you know, also, you just want to know what you're getting sort of buy with full disclosure. Like there are plenty sure. of operations that run an awesome, but it's, it's a rugged, rustic hunt. You know, there's only, yeah. you know, there's only so much you can do on a, on a sheep hunt, right? Because right. you got to carry your shit. Like that's, you know, it's. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the setup to it isn't I I important. I, you know, you guys, right. I think I've told the story about like my first sheep hunt, where you know, basically turned into like a self-guided sheep hunt. I had a I had a guide with me, but had never actually even been on a sheep hunt before. Like I, you know, so I was figuring this stuff out as, as we go, and that you know, that's the difference is understanding that, exactly what, what right. it is. You're I don't. Gonna not not everything's going to be five star. That's right. Luxury I don't need, accommodations. I don't but, need five star. What I do want though is the things you can control to be able to be taken care of. I went on a brown bear hunt on the peninsula years ago. And I mean, it, was, it turned out to be a good hunt, and the guide was fantastic. The outfitter, I don't know if he was struggling financially or what, but I mean, there was not food in camp. There was not propane for the stove. There, it was just a complete, if I had not brought my own kit with, and because of the guide, I'd met the guide in town before we flew out, and he kind of pulled me aside and goes, this is a disaster. There's no food in camp. There's no propane. I'm like, give me a list of what I need. I'll go buy it. And I did. I went to Walmart and bought yeah. a bunch of mountain houses up. Those are the kind of things that an outfitter can yeah. control. And it's still going to be a rough camp. Yeah. But you that expect, first sheep hunt? Mm -hmm. Guide picked me up at the airport in, the, I guess, Wasilla. Hey, we just got to run. There's like a great outdoor shop in Wasilla. I think you know the one I'm talking about. It's it's mm -hmm. like its own, you know, like yeah. a Bass Pro, but like all sorts of high end stuff in there. And is it Barney's? I, I think that's what it is. And yeah. uh, he's just like, well, okay, yeah. What do you need? He's like, I got to get a pair of boots. Like my oh, guide yeah. slash outfitter was getting a new pair of boots. To break the, in the, on your the hunt. day oh, we're flying geez. out on a sheep hunt, like so right. it, that 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 was the start. I'm looking at my brother. That's the guy that you left on the side of the mountain, pretty much, wasn't uh, it? it was, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. You know, we, we yeah. I he couldn't keep I, up. I had to take care of business. It was, you know, we had to get it done. I always love the Cabela's has done it, Gander Mountains done it with their private label clothing, with its guide series, guide version. You know, they'll brand stuff with guides because guides have the best stuff, ostensibly. And then you go to Alaska and you go. They're wearing blue jeans and rubber boots. <laughs> Alaska's amazing that way. It's like they, you know, and they're tough. A lot of times oh, they're yeah. just tough guys. You know, yeah. yeah. They, that's Alaska chic, though. They want to look like that. You know, they want to. Yeah, have they, their, they'd be more comfortable in Kuyu, but they're like, ah, we're gonna no, just doesn't look Alaska enough. You know, <laughs> I gotta be a little bit miserable. <laughs> um, but uh, okay, so um, let's wrap this up uh, with kind of an annual review of Mike Scoby. Um, we we haven't had a like a, a personnel review with Mike. It's been a year. We really um, haven't. I mean, it, we, we have yet to be sued for anything, which is sort of surprising. So uh, uh, I'm going to ask you to rate Mike on a scale of one to five on a few different things. Uh, um, five being uh, very proficient or excellent um, and one being uh, maybe terrible. Um, so uh, knowledge of ATF, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. I mean, use of or use of, uh, use, yes, uh, yes. use of, I'd say five. I mean, you know, the, the intimate details of the ATF and operate. I don't know. I, yep. I, not much, but yes. Yep. So uh, very proficient in drinking alcohol, using tobacco, and using firearms. I haven't seen you use too much tobacco. And, you know, as, as a cigar guy, we haven't actually done much of that yet. But we, I'll step that yeah, up. Yeah, we, we got we to we step up <laughs> so that. So there's room so for that, improvement on tobacco like usage. Four and a half just because of the tobacco side of okay, things. And, yep. you know, I'm not much of a drinker, so, uh, you know, the tobacco side sort of. Uh, fills in that void. Yeah, I would have. I, I think I've seen Mike use plenty of tobacco. So you just haven't haven't <laughs> haven't been around at three o'clock in the morning with Mike. Well, and I had I Mike fall down the stairs at my house once, uh, yeah. which had nothing to do with alcohol. Honestly, that was a pure pure fall. I, I mean, there's a he's, he's looking for an imaginary bathroom when there's one in his room, and yeah. I, I heard the fall, and it was loud, and it was like three in the morning, and I remember uh, just being like, I'm not going out to check because if he's dead. 
He's already dead. He's dead. He's dead. Uh, We'll deal with it in the morning. At least I won't lose on it. It was very pragmatic. I had not slept in that house since that fall. And so last night, same thing. I had to get up and go to the bathroom like three in the morning. And I turned the lights on outside and I looked at those steep stairs. I'm like, oh, we've had history. (laughs) (laughs) And I walked out. I'm like an 80 year old man. I mean, holding rail and walls. Well, they have a steel lip on it. They have a steel lip and they're steep. He was. He was pretty fucked up. I mean, I saw you the next morning. I give them <laughs> oh, I had ribs. multiple cracked ribs. <laughs> it was. Yeah. It wasn't like he was hurt. Yeah, yeah. he was hurt. He like, was wounded. Yeah, that, that was ribs was like, and hip was all bruised. And that was a bad fall. Yeah. Um, but there's, a, there's a bathroom in that room. I didn't know that. It was pitch black. <laughs> First night I ever stayed there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, and you had been drinking, so we're not going to say that there was that had nothing to do with it. Um, so. Um, just overall performance within Field Ethos doing his actual job. I listen, I, I, honestly, I, I got to give him fives, probably across the board with other, what other, whatever categories you're going to come up yeah, with. Yeah, he is a five. Breaking. But, like, he's a great dude to hang out with. Like, and that's, uh, dude, that's what this started at. Yep. I mean, it, it was literally you and I in some conversations, a couple other friends on, like, basically text messages, like, laughing at the shit that has like this industry has become in so many yep. respects. It's like, what the fuck is going on? Like, you know, all these people that represent hunting, it's like, dude, I've never shared a campfire with a guy like that. Right. Like, and, they, and I've been all over the yep. damn world. You know, I, maybe not like Mike, but pretty damn close. Yep. Uh, you know, for my age and whatever it is, like I, I don't know the people that are supposedly the voice of hunting anymore. And it's like, uh, and so, you know, he's, he's filled that void, you know. He's a perfect hire right, for he's, us. He's a perfect hire. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, Thank I, you. Like, We'll we'll come up with something by a bonus season to make sure that it's no. Not so I, I'll tell you what it was like. It, I, I'm I did, happy to be partnered with them. So Don and I have a uh, what I consider to be an elite club um, uh, where we are aficionados of um, essentially women in yoga pants. Um, it's called the appreciation of the arts thread. Because it, it is the arts. It is the arts because I mean, uh, arts yoga is going is, so many different ways. I mean, uh, there's music, they're dancing, um, they're in yoga pants. It's fantastic uh, and. You are part of that thread, and you never contribute. I've kicked you out of that thread before and then brought you back on. I just made a comment the other day wait, because wait. I, I felt that like I'd his never first make one. Yes. Yeah, when he did. comments, it's like great material. Yeah, it's I mean, funny. It's just like, I just want to show that I was there. I didn't have much to say, but I wanted to make sure. I'll, I'll come up with something better. I've kicked out some very famous people of this thread for not part- – uh, Eric Trump, he's like, oh, I want to be in the yoga thread with you guys. I'm like, okay. I booted his ass out like two weeks later because he wasn't pulling his weight. I'm, I'm going to pull my weight. Um, that, that's need, one area I can improve. Yep. Yeah, one area where you can improve is is uh, um, collecting and submitting photos of women in yoga pants. Uh, with that, I will say, um, dude, I'm so glad that uh, not only not only to be working with you, but to be your friend and and to learn from you. I've learned a lot from you since we brought you on. I, I, I would probably say uh, from any one person on Field Ethos, I've learned more from uh, from you than anybody. Um, and so that's been, that's been a big help to me. Um, so dude, um, thank you for being a guest with us. I know you've hosted with us before, but we wanted to have you on as a guest so people could like, get to know you, get to know what we think about you, uh, as your coworkers. We need to do friends. like th- an entire episode or 10 I, of I Mike with like just the stories around camp. Cause like it, it, there, well, I think you could do that, not just my thing. stories, but I'd love to hear your favorite hunts and yeah, your, yeah, you know, yeah. best trip you ever went on and yeah. what your favorite rifle is. I mean, Jeff asked me a question this morning. He's like, you got one gun out of your safe. What would it be? That's all you get to keep. Yeah. yeah. That's a tough question. That is a tough question. What, what would it yeah, be? Yeah, I mean, that's a whole podcast by itself. He has yeah. a harpoon gun. Like, Scooby I mean, has like, every he's gun. He's got everything. I mean, so what do you bring? Yeah. Like, <laughs> what do so you bring? I pulled out this gun this morning that my buddy, uh, Danny DeRico gave me. Um, it, it's at your house because I brought it down to the cabin a while back and just left it there. And it's a um, it's a pump thirty Remington. I mean, it's it, it, things have been out of production Model for 25. 75 yeah. years. They haven't made these things. And Scooby comes in and he sees me like pulling it out of the case and he goes, "Oh, I love those things. Which caliber is that? I have one in twenty five twenty, and I also have blah blah blah. Uh, yeah. The carbine well, is far well, more rare than that. And I, I saw that a couple of weeks ago. I was like, "There's a gun case, and I don't even know what's in it." Which yeah, not totally out of out, norm out of for, for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh shit, I forgot I bought that one. Yeah, uh, I, I do that like, a lot. Ooh, that's got <laughs> that's that, cool. That, 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 that almost got uh, got missing, dude. Uh, all of my guns that come down J- here. Jason's gun was in a boating accident. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I brought a uh, I brought a rifle down uh, a Springfield Waypoint, and I I said, Don, um, let your boys hunt with this thing for a while. It's a really good gun, and uh, and I have a Leupold Mark V on it. And uh, I think it was Spencer or something that killed something with it a while ago. And um, well, Spencer killed his first his first animal with it. Yep. Uh, we took it. He just shot it. I mean, he's he was I guess eight at the time or just just turned nine. 
I mean, it's a 308, and it, you yeah. know, but it, it, the thing shoots lights out, like all, like all the waypoints. We've talked yeah. nothing. I could say nothing, but like it literally shoots as good as we have, what, four of them between us and like 6.5 PRC, I think it's 6.5 Creedmoor, 308, and like they all shoot lights out. Well, I he, knew I was never getting this one back. He, well, no. Once he killed his first deer with it, he killed his so, first deer with it, then he, my buddy was like, hey, Spencer, you want to do some calling? And he just lit up, and I mean, he, he went on a, a spree uh, that weekend, all for QDMA purposes, but... <laughs> yeah, you, you were never seeing no, that. I knew again. I was, I was never like, going right, to see that gun. I don't even care. So I bought his now. I bought another one, and um, but I did tell Don. I was like, "Hey, uh, at some point, I'm going to take that loop old uh, Mark V off of that 308." And Don's like, "The hell you oh, are? No, like, you know, like <laughs> I really probably overscoped. I mean, he's, he's like, I really don't. Which is a great yeah. long range gun, but like for probably, 308. You, you know, what I mean? but like I was like, Spencer's like, he's just not having that. Right uh, now. Uh, Don's like, I really don't have you know enough scopes right now, and I'm like, you're 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 Cabin oh. looks like a pro shop. Oh, it's crazy. I've got a bunch of gear, as you know. And well, I no, walk, no, every time I walk into your place, I'm just like, oh, my God. Oh, uh, like, by the, the way, that, that's, that that Tiger that, Stripe. That's not even. Yeah. Dude, that Tiger that's Stripe Kalashnikov 10%. is. Uh, that is, right? That's Scobie cool. and I are after yeah. that. It's, it's the same pattern as this shirt. Yeah. And I walked in and I saw that. And Kalashnikov USA, who we'll be working with this year, um, really cool company. AK, they they make AK forty sevens. They're just um, doing cool shit with them, though. They finally made AKs like was this badass. one. Was like, that one like a special one for you? Because that one is. They had really done cool. it. I saw it. I, I dude. I went. I went into. I guess Eric, my brother, was like talking with them for a while. He's he's maybe as bad or as worse than me. And like and knowledge wise, he, he's yeah. making his own. Like he built his own rifles and stuff like that. He's he's a super nerd. Uh, when it comes, and he was talking to them for a while, so I walked into like their booth, and they're like, oh, "I've been talking to Eric for months, like yada yada yada." He, uh, and I was just, I did so much with ARs. I actually never spent that much. It's like one of the few platforms I didn't spend that much time. And I, was, I hit it off with the guys, and they're like, "Hey man, we, you know, check this thing out." And I saw that at the booth, and I was like, "That's awesome. I have That's to great. have that gun." No, I'm not a huge AK fan. I like them. I like the we were talking about this this morning. They're super functional, super reliable. Um, the ergonomics could be a little bit better on them, but that one in particular, you pick it up and you just go, oh, yeah, this fits. Yeah. So, so we're going to be doing a Field Ethos uh, collab rifle with them. Um, and we may nice. do something like a Battlefield pickup rifle, make it look a little bit like a Battlefield pickup with, like, premium, like, functionality. Um, so we've got all kinds of options we can do there. But that one that you have, big big fan, the trigger is awesome, which is usually not something not you find case. in an yeah. AK. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so um, Scobie and I, when you go back to Jupiter today, we're going to head back to the cabin. We're going to kind of do a little shopping around your cabin, find some stuff that we like. And you beat us up a few times yeah. on some gear, so we're going to have to. The AK is missing when you get yeah. back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so be it. All right. Well, dude, thank, thank you, you for coming on as our guest. Uh, we thank love you. Me. You're you're just great. Um, everybody loves you. So. Um, thank you for coming on, and we're going to um, find somebody else to have on the podcast uh, here in just a few minutes. Let's do it. All right. <laughs>